Hi, hello there, and welcome to Man with a Mentor. I am the man, your host, Matthew Bernard, and you may be wondering what a show called Man with a Mentor may be about. And basically, it's about um, people and their driving ambition behind something they wanted to do, and they just will not give up. They bite down on it and won't let it go until they've got there. And I have a guy here, it's Stephen Levinson. I'm going to read a little blurb about you, and I'm going to say Stephen Levinson is a comedy writer who has written for Jim Henson Studios and The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, and he's the creator and co-host of the podcast The Novelizers, right? That's that's all correct. That's correct. Oh, yeah. good. Okay, I'm two for two. All right. Um, let's first... Um, Let's talk about the podcast. Sure. I was curious about yeah, yeah. that and what it is and how it works and pe- how people can find it and the name of it again and plug, yeah, yeah. plug it. And I, t- will, I will plug this podcast. It's called The Novelizers. And the idea is we take uh, classic films that you all know and love, uh, The Matrix or Dirty Dancing or uh, films like that, and then we uh, divide it up into scenes give each scene to a different TV comedy writer and they like they turn it into basically an audio book uh, and then we get celebrities to narrate them so over the course of a season you'll hear one movie told from start to finish by dozens of different writers and dozens of different narrators oh god yeah oh. I've been working on that does elevator pitch for a while. oh <laughs> right know. do they like does it all like come together or is it I hope so. Or or sometimes you're like, oh, all these people worked on this and it got like off track. No. Well, the idea is that we kind of want it to get off track. The idea is that you already know the film. So we don't have to explain every detail of the film and everyone involved can just have fun with it. So, uh, you know, we'll get like a Colbert writer and they'll they'll put their you know, they'll write it in their own style, uh, adding adding jokes. And we don't we don't uh, we don't really. Insure, insist they they stay too close to the plot. Oh right. Yeah. How do those people have time? How you find? How do you find those writers and those actors? Yeah. And how do you say please work on this for me? Help me. So I email them and I say please work on this for, <laughs> for me. Help me. Uh, yeah. I mean, so I I was a comedy writer for a while. I, I am a comedy writer, so I know personally that um, I don't know the the. You're not, usually you have to work and, you know, write in the voice of of your host or the show. It it very, you don't have that many opportunities to just write whatever you want with no notes. So that's kind of, we give them total freedom uh, to write it any way they want. And I think it's it's fun. I, uh, it's a low time commitment because they just have one scene. They don't have to come up with a plot or characters. They just get to I think do the fun part, oh, which is right. making it funny. Right, so, and yeah. then they're familiar with it. It's not like they're like having to invent a whole new world. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I think the as like I think as a comedy writer, at least for some comedy writers, right, it, the 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 plot and the characters are kind of the boring part, and you just want to make it funny. So this, you know, they already have that's all handed to them, and they know what scene they're gonna. Right, and they just like add jokes. <laughs> oh yeah! Oh, that's yeah. exciting. And yeah. where can people find it? Uh, wherever you get your podcasts, uh, wherever you get this podcast, I'm sure. Right, just right. Uh, search for the Novelizers. So let's go back, like way back, way um, back. to when you were this little Stephen. Yeah. Um, like, what was it that like led you on the path of like this is what you like want to do what was the like moment of like the light bulb yeah started going off or fireworks i mean i um my dad had a lot of comedy albums and he was he took like my brother and i to films like you know like airplane uh top right. secret those those kinds of films so and i love them um I, I remember I was really into Weird Al. I had every Weird Al oh, album right. I could get. So the idea of parody, I, I like that from uh, from a young age. And uh, I I was also really a, a big fan of late night television. I would watch, you know, I'd stay up late to watch SNL. Uh, I got a tiny little black and white TV for my bar mitzvah, and I would set an alarm <laughs> to watch. So I would go to bed, and then I would set an alarm to watch uh, David Letterman. And I thought that was just like the most 
brilliant thing I'd ever seen. Is that certain people love comedy, but they can't be funny themselves. Like, how did you start to craft your own like mind to think of things to be comedic about? And who did you show work to and said, "Oh my gosh, you've got something yeah. here. Like, nurture it, take it, do it." Yeah, great question. Um, I I started just writing comedy in uh, high school. I started a little comedy magazine at my high school. Um, then I like when I went to college, I went to University of Michigan. There's a there there's like this long tradition, hundred year old tradition of college humor magazines. So I did that for a while. Um, I got you know I had, I had like high school. I had a couple of high school teachers who were really uh, encouraging. Um, okay. So I think that that helped a lot. You know, I never. It's it's hard to know if you're any good. Uh, right. So I just like. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I'm any good. But oh, no. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I don't, you know. Well, you're doing something, right? So when you went to college, what was your major? I mean, I don't think a lot of colleges have comedy writing as a major. So how did you, yeah. like, do that, but also learn other practical things at the same time? Um, well, I haven't learned anything practical, but I did. I was an English lit major, and, uh, yeah, just spent too much time at the College Humor Magazine just hanging out there and, you know, trying to make the other people there laugh and writing jokes. So I guess in a way that did prepare me. Right. Because it's tough. Those, I would assume those rooms where everybody's pitching jokes, it's probably collaborative but competitive. Is that yeah. a good way to say it? Or? Yeah. So some rooms are, um, and I certainly haven't r worked in as many different positions as some comedy writers, but... Uh, yeah, I've I've been in collaborative rooms and I've been in competitive rooms. Uh, I bet collaborative is probably better. You're right. Right. <laughs> You're right. You don't get much past uh, me. Yeah. No. Um, uh, I don't know. I think different personalities maybe thrive in different environments. I certainly prefer collaborative to competitive. My job at Fallon was uh, monologue writing. You know, just set up punchline. You know. You try to make jokes as like short and punchy as possible. Um, right. You write like a hundred jokes a day. You know, are you happy if you've written like forty jokes for someone and they say three, or are you like, right. oh, there was only three in there? Or how many like so, makes you happy? <laughs> so at Fallon, uh, if you if there was a day where. Uh, you didn't get any jokes on the air, which happened all the time. Uh, you were just uh, miserable. Uh, oh. And you thought like, oh, I'm gonna get fired tomorrow. And half the writers I think were walking around saying, I'm gonna get fired tomorrow all the time. Uh, four jokes was like a great day. Uh, you know, go out and buy a car kind of day, uh, right. at least for me. Um, so somewhere in between, you know, if you got a joke, or two on, that was all right. Right. How do those people that have worked on this night show or whatever, late night shows, like become like the senior people that have been there for like five years, 10, 15, 20 years, like how do they survive? Yeah. Or, like are they just like the funniest and they always get a joke in every night or do they just kind of like run the room and everyone loves them so they're, uh, there isn't that, how so does it work? yeah, I'm sure every show is a different. I mean, a lot of it's like how your personality meshes with the host, and if you get along with the host, that's part of it. Getting lots of material on uh, also is important. Um, if the show, I mean, when I was there, when the show was doing well, everyone was happy. When the ratings like sunk, they they were looking for. Mm. People let go and they would do rounds of layoffs, you know, um, and you're only on, a, I mean, you know, if you're on the, worked for the WGA, you're on a very short contract. It was like, what, like 11 week. Oh, I forget now. You know, your contract oh, was right. up every couple months. Oh, so right. you had to like, you were either renewed or you weren't renewed. Oh. Um, yeah. Oh, what's so that like? Like, I mean, it's miserable. Do they invite <laughs> you in and you're like praying to the gods above or? You yeah. Know? You got, I got like. I think I got an email from my like from my agent saying, "Hey, you're renewed," and then I could like breathe. 
<laughs> but as that, you know, as the weeks creep up, uh, right. it gets more and more nerve wracking. And, and writers aren't, well, comedy writers aren't that uh, confident to begin with. How involved are you in writing the questions and the material that is happening between the host and the guest? Is that scripted content yeah. or is that on them to just like yeah. ask the, the guests things that are popping into their head? So that's a job called the segment producer does that. Oh, right. So every now and then there would be like a sketch with, you know, I mean, not every now and then, pretty often. If there's a sketch with a guest, we write that. Right. Um, you know, if... I, uh, you know, sometimes they'll want to ask, sometimes they'll ask the writers for questions, but that was pretty rare. All right. All right. Now, how did you get <laughs> that plum gig? Like, what were you doing and who were you interacting with and networking with yeah. to have that in, like, land in your lap? So yeah, it, sir, it did not. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, so, there's some people who are, like, toiling away and trying to, like find the right connections to get gigs like that and they can't they never seem to be able to like get the job but you did and how did that happen and yeah. what did you do to like you know so grab it yeah it was a really long route for me and I, I was when I got it I was much older than a lot of the other writers in the room um, so yeah I, I moved to New York after college um, I had had an internship at uh, Conan Actually, the second week of the show. I mean, second, sorry, second season of the show. Um, and then I, yeah, I moved to New York and I just had no idea how to get back into that world. So mm -hmm. I didn't know how to like, how to get an agent, how to be seen. This was like kind of before the UCB, before YouTube, before Twitter, and before all those, a lot of ways that people now get seen. Oh, right. um, so I was just, I was doing like jobs Un, totally unrelated to comedy and just doing like I, I started a comedy website with some friends um, and eventually I you know I had a friend who a, a college friend who worked at a, a different college humor magazine who uh, he got a job at the Daily Show um, I I got a job like in the digital department of Comedy Central not really doing anything too creative uh, but I would help this friend with, he, he would put on sh like live shows and I would help him with design and stuff. And I'm a right. terrible designer, but right. uh, he didn't know anyone else. And I knew how to use PageMaker or whatever it was back then. Um, right. So f like one day the head writer of the Daily Show like left to start his own show and um, and he put in a packet for me. So you, mm. a packet is how you usually submit to a show. They, right. they'll, you're kind of writing in the style of the show. Um, and so I got that gig. It lasted, the show was canceled almost immediately. I, I'm, my wife and I moved to LA for that job. Uh, oh. And it was like, it ended, it was an amazing, uh, crazy job, uh, which I can tell you about. But uh, that ended quickly, but I got along really well with that Ed writer. Um, and right. he put in a good word with um, to, to someone at Fallon. Um, right. But then I'd, you know, in the meantime, I'd, I'd applied to other, things and gotten pretty far but hadn't quite gotten them so right. yeah I think it's a combination of super hard work uh, you've got to write jokes that people like and right. connections there was something that you had known um, like a piece of advice if someone had said Stephen like do this don't do this that would have like helped you along the way um, or some piece of advice that you could give, like in your field, um, of either something to do or not to do, like what would that be? Um, yeah, so t two great questions. Um, my advice was, would be to my past self, um, first of all, when I had that Conan internship, I was actually offered a writing job there and I turned it down because I was terrified and I was like, oh, I'll just finish college and come back. Uh, that was a huge... Uh, I'm not supposed to curse on this podcast, right, but it right. was a huge effing mistake. All right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I oh. think the one piece of it, that piece of it would be just like, forget about fear. Just go for it. I mean, everyone has imposter syndrome. So just, you know, I if it's not meant to work out, someone will find out and <laughs> can you eventually. But at least in the meantime, go for it. 
Um, right. And then I always thought of myself as a writer and not a performer, but really I should have like taken improv classes and, and kind of gotten into that scene early on in New York because a lot of, you know, it's, it's a lot about networking too. My, the advice I give people is just like, find people to collaborate with and make cool stuff with them. Like if you can edit video, find someone and you want to be a comedy writer, like find some comedy writers who are making a, like a film on their phone and just offer to edit it for them or something. Just like right. start working collaboratively with people who want to do the same things as you. Because if you move to New York or LA and you know take classes at the Groundling or UCB or whatever the current comedy uh, thing is, someone you know is gonna like get on SNL or become a writer at a nice room. And if you're nice and personable and funny and talented and hardworking, they'll think of you. You know, you're not in New York or yeah. LA like at the moment. Um, I mean, do you think that's where the big jobs and big money and all that is, or like, what are you gonna do? Now, um, I can give you my positive and my negative answer. The positive, a little both. Let's <laughs> mix it. Let's mix it up. Stir it up. Uh, the positive answer is that, uh, I mean, I make this podcast. We get some pretty, uh, pretty great narrators and guests and write. I mean, we get writers from like every comedy room. We get our, you know, we've had Will Forte and Wayne Brady and Patton Oswalt, a great, great narrators. Um, yeah. And I, I make this podcast from from Dayton, Ohio. So right. the positive thing is you can, you can do this from anywhere, uh, yeah. more than ever. Uh, and you don't need to be in New York or LA. Um, the negative aspect, <laughs> the negative answer is that like my comedy career is over. I, when I moved <laughs> to Dayton, I was like, well, I, you know, in terms of work ba life balance, it was tough being a dad, uh, and a husband working at a late night show. I, I was not, uh, I hadn't risen up in the, in the writer ranks enough to like be creating my own shows. And it was time to like, uh, <laughs> I'm over 50. It was time to like <laughs> focus on my family. You right. know, I live in Dayton. I have a, like a great nine to five ish job, uh, that, that is reasonably creative and with, with cool people and right. I can work on my podcast and that, you know, I can do my quote unquote art. So, right, right. You yeah. know, I, my well. Sometimes a a compromise of life is it's not positive or negative. It's just what you are doing at the moment to like fill the needs that are the most important in those times. You know what I mean? I that is amazing. Well, <laughs> you just, you just changed your no life. Idea. <laughs> I had no idea. I was like, I just spoke a bumper sticker no and i'm not great, sure if anyone would no, understand it i uh um, no you're absolutely right do you want to tell about what you're doing now uh at my day job yeah 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 so i'm i'm, I'm giving a shout out okay i'm the creative director uh a creative director at real art which is uh a really cool ad agency creative agency in downtown dayton uh and their specialty is they kind of they kind of make everything in the house so um you know, they, they have a, they have, they call it the dev lab where they, they'll like do programming or they'll actually fabricate things for museums or they'll, uh, you know, they'll, we did have designers and writers and graphic designers. So we kind of do everything right there in the building. It's in downtown Dayton. I mean, ideally it's fun. I, yeah. Ideally it's fun. Right. <laughs> let's just, let's just end right there. Ideally yeah. it's fun. Yeah. I'm going to thank my guest, Steven Levinson for being here and talking about this was fun. comedy right oh thank you yeah. um all right well um and now i got to promote it i guess <laughs> <laughs> i'll get there people all right um i want to thank my guest again steven levinson and thank everybody out there for listening or watching to another episode of man with a mentor thanks